Lower buddy. Uh, so here we are again. Uh, we have a very special guest who you've never seen on the internet before, I don't think. Uh, I know this is probably going to be his YouTube debut. Uh, I hope he's not nervous. But um, before we get to that, and this quote will come to bear later, um, I just wanted to update real quickly D versus M 1979 progress. I'm actually, unusually, kind of significantly ahead right now. As of right now, I'm not expecting that to be the case through the rest of this D versus M 1979 process. But right now, uh, I'm supposed to be, uh, if I was on schedule, I would be starting page 23 right now. Uh, but I started it on like Wednesday or something. And it is, I bet I could finish it tonight, certainly by tomorrow. So I'll be almost a full week ahead, which will be pretty cool. Not quite a full week, but almost a full week ahead, which is good because I alluded to this last time. The next page is a bear like that. And that's also one, not only is it going to be, a, a, even in the best case scenario, a difficult page, an involved page to draw, and a kind of a splashy page. It's a full panel page that I want, you know, those are the ones you especially, I mean, spend time on all of them, but you especially want to make that count. Um, it's also a page where, and I've talked about this a little bit with other things in the comic, I don't have the clearest idea of what this thing I'm going to be drawing looks like yet. Because uh, I I prep and I prep and I prep and I come up with a lot of concept stuff, but I there's some things that I don't commit to a final look. This is how it's going to look in the comic. This is how I'm going to draw it every time. Until I do that first time and basically I noodle with it and try different things and experiment until I finally say like, yeah, that looks cool. That's now how that thing looks and I'm going to do it that way every time going forward. I haven't gone through that process yet. So having more than a week, if I want to stay on schedule, to figure that out is kind of nice, which is part of why I tried to work ahead on this page, on page 23, because I want to give myself lots of room for page 24 to figure things out and get it right. Um, so that's where I'm at. So as a result of that, um, I'm not going to be working much or at all today while the broadcast is going on because it's i'm on page 23 and it's well past the kind of screw around with it while i talk stage like i'm, I'm really deep in kind of the inking part and I, I can't do those two things at once but it's fine because i'm way ahead so squatch relax just relax just you're right here I need you to be right here, right now. I need you to kind of bring it down a lot. Okay. Um, let's say here. Let's bring in. Uh, oh, cool. Hey, Paul. Nice, 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 nice. Cool. Good luck with that. I admire your ability to do caricatures because I do not love doing that. So I'm, I'm always impressed when I see your, but okay. Now for our special guest, for his internet debut, everybody, uh, please give a warm welcome to Josh. Hello. Josh I'm so Ramon. glad to meet the internet. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> it's, it's like a first time. Yeah. Right. Yes. I, so don't be scared. Don't be nervous. I love it. Um, so I was, uh, gonna work while while doing this, but I kind of wanna I wanna stay focused. So I'm gonna take take a minute away from the pages. Okay. Well, I'll look at out. at any time if you <laughs> want. Like I understand because yeah. this is something. So I actually did some prep for this interview. Oh wow! I actually have <laughs> questions, uh, awesome. but we'll we'll. I don't know if I'll actually ask all of these, but last night I sort of wrote down like different things I thought would be interesting to cool. hear from you. But, I'm excited. Uh, but at any point, I know I don't know if we're going to get to it in this, 
I think I allude to it with a few questions, but you have a pretty monstrous uh, task ahead of you right now. And I know you're pretty busy. So if at any time you need to work while we talk or you need to call, it's like, all right, that's all the time you get today, Gary. I need to no. go back. <laughs> no, we're good, man. Totally understand. I, I don't think any artist like shies away from like the opportunity to talk about their work for a long time. That's, no, that's no. what we all do. I, I think, well, and I think this is embarrassing to admit. Tell me if I'm the only one, <laughs> but I think a lot of us kind of like to daydream about being asked questions about our work. Yeah. You know, like really being like, let's put the spotlight on you and really dig into you as a creator and your work and what you think about it. Yeah, for stuff. sure. There is something appealing. I think about that more than I think about like breaking out, you know what I mean? And getting yeah. like a big audience. Like no, that, totally. the, the Charlie Rose interview was always like, that's when you've arrived. <laughs> but, I agree. Yeah. Here we go. Um, never before seen. I think it's Kremble, Josh. Yeah, it's, it's Mr. Kremble. That's, is, is that's what I'm under. Right? Yeah. Um, I, I guess for anybody who hasn't heard that story, maybe I should mention the Kremble thing. So I did uh, TCAF, which is like a Toronto Comics and Arts Festival. Um, and uh, I was doing a panel on like neurodiversity and like uh, representation in comics and stuff like that. And it's like all the panelists are listed. And then for me, it says Joshua Kremble um, with an R. And of course, my name is spelled K-E-M-B-L-E. Right. But uh, it was like this on running bit for like the whole weekend. My publisher, even jokingly, like uh, Kendra, my editor was like, I'm totally tweeting Kremble. <laughs> and so she tweeted out like, you know, don't miss Kremble's uh, like like um, uh, panel. But it was like a whole thing. So now I kind of feel like I need to do like street art mm -hmm. or like some kind of divergent art as Kremble. I mean, you got to do something with it because yeah. it sounds like a word. I mean, yeah. it sounds like a real thing. Yeah, like, that sounds like an um, arch villain. You know? Yeah. I told you I thought it sounded very much, I'm like an old D&D &D guy. So it, mm -hmm. I, to me, it seemed like some sort of goblin creature. Yeah, for know, sure. Like a Kremble, like a pack of Kremble's approaches. Yeah, I can um, totally see that. So let's work through some of these questions here um, <laughs> before we get that. Uh, so I, I, I just encountered this quote and I felt like it related to a little, so I've been joking. We've been joking for a couple of weeks now, like we're going to be talking about death, death yeah. you know, and, and I don't actually intend that to be like the entire topic. Yeah. Um, so I encountered this quote just randomly two days ago. Uh, and for those, I don't know, for anyone who's just listening and not, and not watching the screen, it's, it's an Orson Welles quote. And it says, uh, if you want a happy ending, that depends, of course, on where you stop your story, which I thought was, it's very Orson Welles. It's kind of brilliant. And it's kind of like you can sort of mine a lot out of that. But when I heard it, I, my head immediately went to death. <laughs> because yeah. I thought death is sort of the ultimate ending to the story. And it's yeah. the ultimate ending to the story that determines whether the story was good or bad. Because I'm preoccupied a little bit. Now, I, I, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm preoccupied in like an edgy teenager way, you know, but I think I just, I probably think about death and mortality more than average. Yeah. And I think part of it is my day job, which is sort of death adjacent. And then uh, probably a larger part of it, if I'm being honest, is that I lost a parent earlier than usual. Not as early as some, not some people, you know, lose their parents when they're six or something. I was, I was in college. I was much older. But my mom died when I was in college. And I think those sorts of experiences, you know, just reframes. Going through that makes you think about it differently. And maybe in a my case earlier than when people normally you know everyone loses their parents if they're lucky if they don't that means that your parents lost you <laughs> yeah. you know like so eventually this is going to happen but it's usually like farther off you know so grappling with it as a younger person i think can have a big effect on your identity the reason i bring this all up 
is because it's something that we have somewhat in common. The circumstances yeah. were totally different, but it's it's something that we were uh, met with that experience younger than most. And you were talking a few weeks ago in a vlog about death and art and mortality being a motivator to create and things like that. And I think I left a comment to the effect of, I'm, you know, think about those things too, for all the reasons I just explained. Yeah. And your reply, I thought was not intentionally, and I think not to anybody else, but to me, sort of amusing because, and I tell me, I may be characterizing it wrong, but you're, I felt like your response was something like, because I had said something like, well, you know, when you lose a parent earlier than most, I think it might orient you towards thinking about those things. And you said something to the effect of like, I think it did have an effect on my art. And I, to me, that was just sort of such a crazy understatement where not only do I think it probably had, like undoubtedly had an effect on you. Yeah, on yeah. You're wanting to create. But to me, from the outside looking in, your work, which I'm familiar with, so like these two, and then the one you're working on now that you're drawing, death is not only a theme, it's arguably the theme you know yeah. like when you look at it so for to me that's why i was like oh it's kind of an understatement to say like yeah it might have had a effect it's like it's woven all through it like yeah. it's all there like to me it's plain to say but again i might be oriented to that too so my first question was what's your reaction to that do you agree that it's an, a theme in your work do you agree that it's a primary theme in your work do you feel like no not really that you think there are other things that are more important and that but that's an element but not i'm seeing more of it because of my orientation no i mean it's a it's a huge theme it's it's um it's probably the inspiration for a lot of the work um it's a a theme and a topic that i always mine um i you know i think jacob's apartment is kind of fictionally documenting my father's death and uh, the whole character's crisis in it, like the main character, Jacob, his main crisis throughout the whole book is like responding to like a, a kind of crisis of faith from like seeing his father die, you know? And it's like, it's this very, um, yeah, I mean, the whole book is about like purpose and death and like, what, how do you find your identity when you know that like there's a limited time. <laughs> right. Um, I think two stories like starts off with like kind of questioning like what the purpose of life is if you just die. Um, it's, uh, you know, the second book will also like more uh, like of two stories, which you've seen like most of the roughs for that. Right. Um, it's like, that's going to get heavily again into like my father's death. So that'll mean I've written about my father's death like twice, which is right. kind of strange. Twice um, and then maybe, well, twice or three times, depending on how you count it. Yeah, exactly. You know, because this to me, and we'll, I, this, I want to talk about Jacob's apartment specifically. In a yeah. Bit, but this to me felt very much like Funhouse Mirror Your Life. You know? Yeah. Like it, so I, I, because I'm familiar with the work you're doing on the second part of Two Stories, like this immediately when I got to those parts and this is like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, like I see. Yeah, it's a it's a huge theme. And I think it's interesting. It's like the the vlog that you were kind of referencing too. it's like, I always think the funniest way to start these conversations, even though it's like, it's a heavy theme is kind of like the whole like, all right, guys, we're all gonna die. So let's talk right. about it. Right? Because um, I think that for artists, for creatives, we're really analytical. And um, we tend to like overthink. Um, and so I think that a lot of designers illustrators cartoonists like are very prone to like some some mental illness or another um because of the fact that like a common thread of like mental illnesses is overthinking and right. so it's like you know um depression is like overthinking the past like anxiety is overthinking the future right. it's like all overthinking and um obsessive compulsive disorder is just overthinking generally yeah. exactly and and so but to do effective comics you have to be able to overthink like you, right. it, it kind of requires overthinking i think that's why yeah. it's such a cool medium but i also well, think as also, artists I would, go ahead i would suggest a risky medium for people maybe like you and i where you're indulging in a kind of 
thought pattern that in normal life would not be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> but, in, but when creating is the only way to do it. I mean, not only overthinking, but perfectionism. Yeah. Is something I've talked about in past videos. Like perfectionism, I think, can be useful if you're a creator, but it can be debilitating <laughs> in just normal everyday life, you know, like if you start applying that to everything. But, yeah. No, I, I mean, it's it's a, it's a, a uniquely artist thing, I think. Maybe not uniquely artist, but I think it's almost required of artists to have especially storytellers, like we have to have a lot of empathy um, because we're getting in characters' heads. And in order to do that effectively, you have to be able to kind of empathize with those people. And like part of being highly empathetic is like thinking about things, thinking about like the purpose and meaning and kind of like deeper ideas. And like, um, yeah, so it's, I, I think um, not only is, is it like the theme in most of my work, I would say like most great art is going to have that as a theme, um, even regardless of like of the genre. Like, I think that you're going to you're going to notice like this theme of death, like weaving through everything. Right. Um, and I think it's interesting that we had those um, similar experiences with like losing our father. Uh, you know, for me, it was like in my early 20s. So it's like I wasn't super young. Right. Um, I have friends yeah. who lost their parents like way earlier, um, yeah. but it was definitely at like an I identity shifting moment. And for me, that awareness of mortality from that. And then of course I had lost other people, you know, in my life and stuff. But I think when you lose people that are close to you, you get this like sense of like the limited time frame that we have to kind of work in. Yeah. And if you're a storyteller and you want to tell stories, it's like, if you are unaware of the limited amount of time, you may never actually tell your story. Right. Um, and so I think that that is also, it should be and is like a driving factor for artists. Like I think, um, I think if people aren't thinking about mortality, I think they might be a little less willing to kind of like, you know, do the work to like make, make stories. Cause it's, cause it's a lot of work and it's a lot of commitment. And it's like, you know, if, if you have all the time in the world, why would you, you know, why would you dedicate like today, Gary, why would you be working on Mar you, dinosaurs versus Mars? Bot? Why would you do anything? Oh, yeah. absolutely. I think it took a while for it to. Um, crystallize in my brain, but I do think one of the lessons I got. From my mom dying was. And actually, it kind of just coincidentally relates back to the Orson Welles quote that it made me for the first time in my life, in a real way, uh, very aware of the fact that we're not guaranteed happy endings. Yeah. That like, it could get cut short. And like, so any of this thought of like, well, someday we'll work it out. Or someday, like I'll get around to doing that thing. Or someday I'll, you know, like someday, like I'll make up with that person. Or, yeah. you know, whatever the thing is that you think, like, eventually it's going to work out. It makes you aware that, like, oh, no, no, no. Like, the music could stop at any moment. And you could be left without a chair. And, like, and how do you feel about that? Like, what, you know, what, does that change any of your calculation today? Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, I think it took, it was years later that I was finally had that kind of awakening of, like, I need to start following through with art. Um, but I think it, the, the, the initial seed was probably that, that aha moment of like, yeah. oh, you know, like, oh, there's you, you know, anytime you're saying like, well, eventually, you know, when I'm retired, I'll, I'll have time to do like, uh, yeah, probably, maybe, probably, yeah. but maybe not, you know, so. Yeah. It also helps, um. It helps with story. It, I mean, it's it's terrible to say that like losing somebody close to you helps in any way. Like it's it's a terrible right. experience, but right. it does help you also, like in storytelling too, because you transparently like when, when like anybody who goes through a loss. Let's say um, anybody listening to this like today just lost a loved one. Right. You will instantly have like the majority of people in your life like y y with good intentions. Uh, start justifying how they're not going to die. Like almost like the second they hear no. it, 
And it's an interesting thing that's like about human nature where it'll be like, well, wow. I mean, if they had just hit the gym more often or like, man, you know, it's I wish they hadn't eaten so many potato chips or like, man, they got to drive like more careful because, you know, and it's like always trying to make it uh, like an action that the person had control over. And, and I think the terrifying, and yet I think the more, uh, because we, we have artists in our community, Gary and stuff. So it's like, I feel like we should gear a lot of this to like creatives, but I think the more helpful thing for creatives is to realize it, it, it doesn't matter what you do. Um, it's coming for you. And like, if that, if, if you're aware of that, um, then like, I mean, obviously you can make wise decisions and stuff like that, but also when you're writing characters, just realize like, it, it, like, like Orson Welles said, like they're, at, they're heading to a destination. Everyone's heading to the same destination. So like, how do you, where do you choose to cut, cut off the, um, the story? And then also if you write a story that has death in it, which most good stories will (laughs) um even a superhero story right is gonna have a character die i mean you have like the the classic uh what is it gwen stacy or whatever yeah um, yeah being like almost the inciting incident for peter parker um and so it's like if you're writing that like you have to be able to kind of analyze like what impact would that have on a human like on a person like on this this individual you're writing i just think it's I think it's the best topic to mine. And I think it is an underlying theme in most work. Um, And I think, you know, it's just a, it's a lovely topic to talk about because, but that also ties into my work because anybody familiar with my work knows everything I write about is the stuff you're not supposed to talk about at parties. Right. Um, Right. And weirdly enough, that's also most of the things I like to like to talk about. So it's, it's an interesting I don't know. I don't know. I, I I like it as a topic a lot. Absolutely. Well, I just, I also, I remember years ago, I saw an interview with J.R.R. J.R. R. Tolkien, where some BBC person asked, like, what's Lord of the Rings about? And in this weird, like, unlike Tolkien moment of brevity, he was like, well, I suppose it's about what every story is about, death. <laughs> you know, like, but it's all, I, I think it, it it is the universal theme. Yeah, you know, I, it's not every story has an element of it. If you're watching, you've got mail. You're not seeing a death thread through it, but like it's or whatever. Harry met Sally, but I think it it's when you combine the two halves of that, death being sort of like the the culmination of a story, or death being like the motivator that causes all this like cascade of effects afterward, which is yeah. sort of, you like, whether it's Gwen Stacy or whether it's talking about, you know, two stories or, you know, something like that. If you lump in all the stories that are using death in that one of those two ways, that's a lot of stories. And I think it's, now this gets into more of a, I don't know. A, I wouldn't say theological, but sort of a spiritual thing, but you know, I think death is what actually makes life matter. You know, I, in my opinion, personally, the fact that it's finite, the fact that life could end, the fact that you only have some time is what makes any of it mean anything. That yeah. If everyone lived forever and there were no, you know, that no one had to deal with parting and no one had to deal with the fact that, yes, at some point the ending will be written to your life. It's all sort of, to me, kind of empty. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what makes... I think, and I, at least in our experiences, that was, it was an experience that focused us yeah. on life. Like, so to say like, well, now that's where I say I'm not like an edgy teenager. I'm not really preoccupied with death. I'm preoccupied with the significance of death, you know, which is yeah. to me more life oriented, but that's, that's. Yeah. And I think that um, I've talked about this. I don't know. I was on a stream I, like yesterday or something and i was talking about some some things that i i realized could sound kind of like holden caulfield ish where it's just like you know like everything's phony it's so lame that kind of thing and the the problem with holden caulfield is isn't 
his observations because even as an adult like i've i've reapproached catcher in the rye and unlike when i was a teenager where i'm like he's saying it for what it is i've been like yeah. oh man this poor kid like just like somebody needs to talk some sense to this kid you know right but yeah. it's like it, it, his problem isn't his description it's his prescription right like um but 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 I feel like a lot of people will just disregard all of the things that Holden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye says that that still to this day is true. Like, yeah, most adult interactions are super phony. Right. Like a lot of things are really fake. Uh, the society is pretty messed up. There are things that like teenagers get hip to. And I think initially it's like really overwhelming for them because it's like. It's like when you trust authority and you first realize that authority is fra like they're human. And so right. they're frail and they make mistakes like that big identity shattering moment where it's like, oh, OK, like society isn't like this structure of rules where you do the right thing and get an A, you yeah. know, um, on some but, level, adolescence is sort of a protracted, it's like a eight year yeah. period of learning that Santa Claus isn't real. Exactly. In, in a lot of different ways, you know, like your mom and dad are just people. Yeah. And authorities can be, yeah. Exactly. Shit and like, yeah, you you start recognizing that. The reaction can be very adolescent. Yeah. Where, you know, you wear a black t shirt and you draw skulls in your spiral yeah. notebook. But which, like, which the, I the, still the do wear black t shirts and draw skulls. So, you know. what's that? I'm like, I still rock some black t-shirts and draw yeah, some that's, I guess that's, yeah, that can never, never goes out of style, maybe. But, um, yeah, but the, the, the awakening is legitimate. Yeah, yeah, and I think that um, the thing is, like, you know, a lot of that stuff can kind of get disregarded later. Like, obviously, you don't want to dwell on things, like, to, a, to the level of a teenager, you know, but, right. but also, like, you know, the fact that death is disturbing shouldn't be like something just people magically kind of go, OK, well, let's just move on from that and forget about that. It's like, no, it's it, because then it kind of comes up and people get all shocked by it again. And it's like, no, yeah. you we, we should be anticipating that and not anticipating it like eagerly, um, but anticipating it and planning our lives accordingly. And also planning our art accordingly and writing our stories accordingly. Because um, if we oh, ignore yeah. that fact, we end up, I think a lot of the time, like, we've all had that point where, like, you've read a comic or something like Death of Superman where you don't even take, like, you don't even feel the death because you know they're going to, like, you know, there's going to be Lazarus pits or, like, some sort of story gimmick to, like, to unsubstantiate the power of death. And it's like, if you do that, like, what is the purpose of the story? And like, if, if there's no stakes, right? Like people don't feel invested in a story. And what, what are our stakes in stories? Really, it's just like, it's the, the fear of like a villain, like threatening someone's life. It's the fear of, like, it's all death. It's all death. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely, anyhow, I'm rambling, but I- No, I no, yeah. you're not. Yeah. So, so Jacob's Apartment just came out. Yes. I, I've read it, uh, of course. Uh, Two Stories has been out for how long? A couple years? Uh, yeah, like about Published, the second year. Yeah. Like it's been out for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I loved both. I recommend both. It was a unique experience reading these, though, because in a way, because I read this, the earlier work, like most of us, after this, the more recent one. I felt like when I was reading this, kind of like Superman, I could see X-ray vision, like the nonfiction bones in it because yeah. I had read this, you know, like so. And because I had seen like what you're drawing for the next one and it, 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 it didn't diminish my experience, but it affected it where I was saying like, OK, I know this is about this is. Yeah, he's lightly referencing or he's very heavily referencing or this is a remix. Like I said, the Funhouse Mirror version of yeah. you know, whatever. While there are definitely themes in common, I do feel like they're distinct works, but I wanted to hear you, the creator, compare and contrast these two works. If someone's sitting there is like, well, maybe this is all the same story. Maybe I just want the nonfiction version, or maybe I just want the fictionalized version that's in color. Yeah. What is the, what, what, talk about what's, what they have in common, but also talk about what's different about these books. 
Okay, so I mean, definitely the commonality would be the theme of death. I mean, that's that's a common uh, thread. But um, so two stories is a very confessional, super autobiographical work that starts at the beginning of a story where I'm very candidly retelling a part of my life where I was about to like jump off a bridge and kill myself. Right. And it's it's always a, a fun interview or a fun topic to talk about at, at, as on an interview because I, that, I, I started I it off. Bite. I'm going to carve that out. It yeah. starts with me thinking about jumping off a bridge and killing myself. It's always a fun interview. To, yeah. <laughs> but it's always a fun topic um, because of the way I structured the book because I, I started with those heavy stakes um, partially to let readers know what they're getting into, like when they when they pick up this book, because if they're not going to be OK with that, it's like I just put it right up front. Like this yeah. is what this book is going to be about. If this is uncomfortable for you, we're five pages in. You you have an exit. Um, but uh, it, it basically is focusing on trying to kind of reconstruct the thought processes that go into um, severe depression. And the sort of ideas and thinking that can lead to like suicidal ideation, and um, it 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 also kind of t touches on like contrasts and compares like the difference between like childhood um, approaches to dealing with depression and then adulthood approaches to dealing with depression, and also kind of comparing the stakes between a childhood conflict like a playground politics kind of situation um versus like an adult conflict where there's like higher stakes and like broken relationships and things like that involved so uh two stories is overall like a theme about kind of finding faith um and uh trying to destigmatize conversations about um, mental health and uh like suicidal ideation um panic disorder and uh and and things like that but it also you know i try to lighten the load when people are reading two stories. So it has like some alleviation with like um, uh, younger stories that again, like have to do with like playground politics and things like uh, dressing up in cosplay as like Indiana Jones for an entire year before cosplay was a word. So it's, it's sort of a, but it's very confessional. It's very much in the tradition of like raw and um zap and like the older kind of indie comics and it's black and white so that's kind of um but it's super super autobiographical um right. jacob's apartment is actually kind of more of a love story um it's very fictional um even though it's influenced by my biography um and even within that um the sort of conflict that Jacob is having is like a theological conflict. Um, and it's juxtaposed with Sarah, who is his roommate kind of going through like an identity conflict because she's sort of been in, in um, she's grown up with like an abusive past. And uh, because of that has like been seeking out like some sort of way to solve her childhood traumas with like modern relationships that aren't working too well. And so she's sort of trying to like reeling and finding her identity. Um, it, it's also kind of like a veiled like Romeo and Juliet, but it's not really Romeo and Juliet, but that's partially the structure is like, it's kind of like two warring houses. So we have like Jacob, who's like a kind of hardcore uh, Christian who kind of grew up in like a very religious environment and is now questioning his faith because of the loss of his father. And that's like juxtaposed against Sarah, who's an atheist and has no concern or interest in that sort of thing, but I think admires um, like the the idea of faith and the idea of belief in something. And and in reality, like this is kind of like the the window view like that I have as an author is like I think both were kind of heading in opposite directions. Like she would probably, were we to continue the story, become some sort of like have some sort of belief in something beyond. And I think Jacob would probably have just gone out to a path of like just pure uh, atheist belief, atheistic right. belief. Right. Um, but the arc is, I mean, I don't know. The, the hard part about talking about Jacob's apartment is what it's really about is a little bit of a plot twist. And it's not like an M. Night Shyamalan plot twist. It's very like sweet 
uh, thing. And it's like one page that kind of reveals that. And I don't want to give away that page because I think it's just too nice for the reader. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, and then it's also a lot of fun. Like it's, a, it, it, I mean, it's, it, none of these books are fun reads. <laughs> they, they, they have fun within the read. They're not um, light reads. That's a good I mean, point. They can yeah. be fun, but they're not, they're yeah. not, I, I, I think they're, and I would like to think sort of like D versus M, sort of like a lot of the people in our community, they're yeah. not things you take in casually. Yeah. Like, I yeah. think you need to kind of sit down, carve out time and sit down and kind of, you know, yeah, uh, give yourself to this experience for a little while. Yeah. So Jacob's apartment, the biggest difference would be like, there's a lot of dream sequences within it and sort of interplay with, um, with like, dreams and reality and so there's and there's a giant theme of dreams woven throughout it like both dreams in the real world where it's like dreaming of becoming something like people you know in their 20s like trying to find their identity and build careers and they have their dreams in that way but it's also about their physical like or their actual dreams when they're asleep and sort of there's a lot of interplay with like both characters' childhoods sort of haunting them through their dreams and their dreams actually connecting. So um, they're very different books. It's full color yeah. too. The style is a lot different. Yeah. Um, uh, the style yeah, of like- Very two, different. Yeah, yeah. I would think most probably wouldn't even suspect it was the same artist. Yeah, and that's something I like doing as yeah. an artist. I like actually switching styles for books. I mean like, you know, you, you're aware of this, Gary, but it's like even this not death, but love, right. which has death in the title. Again, right. And death um, being like sort of the the initial thing that kind of kicks everything into action. You know, it's funny. I didn't even think about that. But yeah, that's true. <laughs> See, again. Yes. My it. work is very right death. There. Yeah. It's like it's it's plain as day. It's in the title. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But anyhow, even in that book, like I'm working in a totally different style. And then Two Stories is very playful with that, like where it, it shifts styles entirely. Yeah. Um, like between two different stories, like the childhood stories and adult stories. They're similar in the sense of I am fascinated with the way that as adults, we kind of carry our past with us. And I think this is a result of like death in a theme. If death is happening, like... Um, then like what is memory and i think that's a really interesting thing to mine uh like I, as a writer and gary i mean i think you do this a lot with uh dinosaurs versus mars bots too where it's like as a writer like the what death causes people to confront like of their own memories and then what is the purpose of those memories and like why do those memories kind of chase us and haunt us into into adulthood it's I I think that that is um, that's just rife and really fun fun to talk about and discuss. So there's there's some similarities and there's some major differences. Um, I'd say Jacob's apartment is much more playful, um, in its kind of approach. But then again, I get pretty playful with my paneling on, in both books. So yeah, well, and when yeah. you're doing the child story in, in two stories that also I would say is more playful than it's funny. It's like with two stories, when you average it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's compared true. To Jacob's apartment, probably Jacob's apartment is more playful. Yeah. But if you're taking, like, if you're treating two stories as two, you know, like, I don't know, the child one is pretty. That's true. The child stories are pretty silly in yeah. Jacob's apartment, uh, yeah. not in Jacob's in two, in, in, in two stories in Jacob's apartment. They're not silly at all. They're very no. depressing. No, they're um, sad. They're very sad. <laughs> like yeah. they're they're actually to me, at least my reaction, the saddest parts of Jacob's apartment. Yeah. You know, like the most difficult to read are about him as a kid. Yeah. But that was my I don't know if everyone would feel that way, but that was my reaction too. Yeah. yeah, so I'm trying to pinpoint other differences or similar I mean, there's definitely similarities. There's a lot of like um yeah, the memories are similar. The, like memories juxtaposed from like childhood to adulthood is very similar. The characters are very different too. Um, like Jacob is not fully me, whereas right. I would say that like in my book, I am like in two stories, I am definitely myself. <laughs> uh, I would hope so. For yeah, I would hope that yeah, that was a fairly yeah. 
Yeah. And Sarah is probably a concoction of about five different people I knew, um, two, two, mostly two of whom were really close friends of mine, um, but not I didn't have like romantic interest in or anything like that. Yeah. Um, but they just seemed like they'd be it. it, it the whole thing was kind of structured based on like um, that, that whole interplay between Jacob and Sarah and them kind of finding young love which is a, the bigger theme of Jacob's apartment is sort of like that first pseudo love relationship that right. a lot of young, so, uh, you know, 20 somethings have. Um, and also just kind of questioning whether, like what is the purpose of, of something if, if there's no love in the, in, in that engagement, you know? Um, I don't know. It's interesting. It is. So, um, I was curious about this. So the past couple, so when, remind me again, Two Stories was published, was it 20, 2020? Or when was that? Yeah, 2020. Okay. Yeah. So that came out, was that just before, or just after the plague hit? Um, I think it was like right before. Right before. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Because maybe I remember you were Wait. Gonna... Oh, it was released like the second everything shut down. Yeah, that's right. I was going to say there was something about shutdown and I was remembering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, Jacob's apartment came out just like a, what, a month ago, two months ago. Yeah. Well, on comic drawing time. I don't remember if something was six months ago or a week ago, but um, J uh, Jacob's was about a month ago. Yeah. A month ago. Okay. So in the span of two years, two stories came out plague hit shutdowns jacob's apartment came out you got your new project that you're working on a lot has changed i would think you've changed a lot in the past couple years what do you think is the most meaningful way you've changed since two stories came out um it's it's an interesting thing i think that um there there's a fun thing that's been happening the last few years in my career where i have been obsessively making these books um often with possibly no hope of the books ever really being in a bookstore or seeing the light of day right. um at most possibly like considering maybe i'll kickstart them and actually a quick interjection when yeah. did you start posting picture like pages of two stories because i know i was reading it online what feels like a thousand years ago yeah, so. I mean, so two stories was a process of about five years to create. And then so for those five years, I was very transparently like posting things as I finished them. Right. And letting, you know, readers and, and friends and stuff like read it um, as I was making it, which I'm a big fan of. I actually think that's a good approach to making comics. Um, and Jacob's Apartment was much the same where initially I had had a publishing deal when I was younger for it and then a publisher just dropped it it was like one of the most heartbreaking experiences of my life um and i will be um making fun of that publisher in two stories book two sure. and i got the blessing of my editor for jacob's apartment on that so by name um, like are you gonna it'll be a really uh familiar sounding name um I to the, yeah but so um slightly a slightly tweaked real name yeah okay. but um uh so so Jacob's apartment, I had pretty much completed, not in the current form of it, but like what I had considered completed, um, you know, and then gone to graduate school and came like kind of figured out how I was going to do two stories. Um, and I had like a kind of crisis when I finished Jacob's apartment because I, I initially was just like, well, this is weird because I finished a book and I have no idea what to do with it. And it's like, I just thought, well, I'll just try to make a, another book. And and I did have a crisis there where it was like, is it worth making these things? Like I spent like five years to make Jacob's Apartment because that was my first time doing a full graphic novel. And of course, like I do with projects, I'm just like, I'll also make it full color and do like everything. Like It's not short. I mean, no. It's it's like 130 something pages. Are your pages numbered? I don't know. I don't, I don't think I numbered these ones, but I, I think it's like 136 yeah, pages. Yeah, it's a thick, you know, people see here. It's a thick book. But it was a long process because like, 
you know, like a lot of us experience, like on your first like big project, it's it's like you often like learn things along the way that could have saved you time earlier on. And I, I was going through that whole thing. So that's probably yeah. why that took so long. Um, and then I and then I made two stories just uh, deciding that like making good books, whether publishers or other people care is what it's about. Like, I'm just going to make the best book I can and then the chips will fall where they do. So what? Okay. And I and that was a big gamble. So then that book takes about five years. So now right. I'm like a decade into making these graphic novels that like no one. I mean, there's some people like in our community and stuff that like we're familiar with it, but like a lot of people didn't know about. And then um, this is why. So that's a long winded way of kind of backing up what what's changed in the last few years. Um, my faith and active faith in doing that has been rewarded like tenfold in the in a matter of a few years. Mm -hmm. And so now I am like. I am more convinced than ever that as artists, if you make good work and you stay faithful to like making the good work and you focus on that first and foremost, that it will find a way. Right. Um, and that like in a weird way, like the universe or God <laughs> uh, has a way of rewarding that. Right. Uh, but, it, but it just takes like, like, because once I got that first book, suddenly I have this second book in my back pocket to just pitch around to publishers. It's interesting. It, it's, it, makes it's think, it makes me think of, um, I hope you, I don't think you would mind me telling this story, but uh, I, don't. I was talking to a mutual friend, Jim Lujan, a few weeks ago, and we both realized we have the same sort of mentality that we, we both think of ourselves, again, Jim, I'm sorry if, if you don't like me speaking uh, freely, like repeating these things, just say I misremembered and you didn't say any of it, and it was all me. Um, but we were sh uh, talking about our shared um, lack of enthusiasm for promotion <laughs> and our shared kind of dis like our, that we were way more interested in making and then moving on to the next thing to make like that, that we don't spend a lot of time like you know we we spend tons of time making the thing lots yeah. of labor lots of love lots of blood sweat and tears and then you put it out there and immediately it's like all right next one and like and it's just sitting out there and the people who know you the people in the 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 people with in the loop you know who are hip to it they're like oh cool new thing and they grab it or they watch it or what depending on who you're talking about uh, but there's not a lot of breaking out, like in trying to get new fans. Yeah. Um, but we both have this perhaps irrational belief. I don't know. We'll find out that once we've accumulated a pile of work, it will be impossible for people to ignore. Like there'll be this like Matt, where it's like, once he has whatever, how many videos, once I finish, like, you know, Diva Zem, all six chapters of this, like, story, there'll be this thing that, like, it just people have to pay attention to. Like, it, it, even if we're bad at promoting our things, like, you just can't deny this accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, and it kind of makes me think of that when you're talking about, like, you know, just keep your head down and do your work and believe in doing good work and eventually it will somehow uh, come to fruition. Yeah. And I think that um, Jim's actually been a huge inspiration in this process. Like Jim and I started hanging out like when I was, I think, just starting two stories. And I even talked with him like we, we used to have those meetups with um, him and like Lonnie Millsap and and um, Ken and like er everybody else like in that circle. And I, one of the things I would talk about was like my dilemma of like, do like what is the point of making this kind of stuff if like i have this finished graphic novel i know it's pretty good and like i can't get anyone to pick it up mm -hmm. um you know what's the point and then i i always would come to the conclusion of like well it's just worth it because art is worth it and you right. just need to make good books because i like good books and if nobody took a risk to make them the books i like wouldn't have been published so it's like this weird thing where um, but Jim's talked, Jim and I have talked about this a lot too, where 
it is weird how i mean it does require some effort like i you know one of the big game changers was getting a literary agent that made a, a yeah. massive difference for like my outlook for publishing um and it's opened up mass possibilities that just weren't there before but the literary agent came from all that previous work you know like it's it's like i had this giant book that was completed um to shop around um at the time if i hadn't spent like a decade making that um i don't know if i could have gotten a literary agent um on just like a whim and so it's it, it is a weird thing it is it is kind of a mix like you have to do a bit of work um, like building a proposal, stuff like that. Like you have to kind of seek out some of it, mm -hmm. but yeah, a lot of it, like, um, and Jim and I have both talked about that a lot, like, um, in, in chats and stuff where even when I, wait, when I sold Jacobs, I was just like, uh, kind of shocked by it. Cause it's an idea. I think I threw to you, uh, Jim and then like Scott and I remember. I remember. And I was just like, Hey guys, like, so the pandemic did like, has taken everything out. I forget. I think I had finished two stories, book two, the roughs for it or, or the script and it was being edited. So it was like this brief period where I had like a couple weeks and I was like, um, I, I, my literary agent wants to pitch something out. Do you, do you guys think I should like just put out Jacobs? Cause I have this finished graphic novel and thank God you guys were like, yes, you should. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I then, think that's what I said. I kind of remember, there was something about the way you framed it where I felt like I had follow-up questions. Like I didn't oh, okay. want to commit to the easy yes. Cause I felt like you were hesitant. I felt like I was perceiving that you were hesitant in some way. I was I a little bit. I explore yeah. your hesitancy before I said, yes, do it. Even though you're hesitant. I wanted like, what is it that you're hung up on? What is your concern? Yeah. I can't even remember what the concerns were now. <laughs> I don't remember either. But I remember I had some kind of reason that I hadn't really pursued yeah. that. Well, but, I, um, I think it was it was kind of, if I remember right, yeah, it was a little like fuzzy, and that's why I was trying to like pin it down because I my memory is that it was something like you had done it, you had tried to shop it around, it didn't happen, you had moved on. Yeah, but like looking back. It yeah. was like a weird, like, do I really want to, like, should I just continue? Like, no, 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 going forward, going forward. And I, like, that's, it was like, a, that's why I was like, it's a little like, what is, what is that about? Like, why, what is the concern? What is, you know, like, what, yeah, what yeah. matter? You know, like, is, I, I, it almost was like, no, 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 we broke up. Yeah. And like, I'm not, you know, <laughs> like. I think you're right, though. I think there was a bit of that. And there, this is kind of one of the cool things about Jacob's apartment, like the kind of second life of it there was a thing that bugged me about the book that I could never quite pinpoint. Yeah. Um, and then once I got the publishing deal with graphic Mundi, um, Kendra, who is like one of the best editors I've ever worked with just was like, um, there's a conversation at the very beginning. I, I, I can spoil it. Cause it's like the very beginning of the book mm -hmm. um, where Jacob and Sarah, like the book starts off. They're in the living room of their apartment with like a documentary on in the background that is about bees and then you know it's it's a subtle like message about what will proceed to happen in the book basically <laughs> but it's yeah. a bee documentary and um kendra is like a beekeeper um it, just just by happenstance and she was like well what if you did something with the bees and that's all it like i don't know how that unlocked this whole thing but it was a way to tie that because th the problem with that was while it was a bit of an analogy, it wasn't obvious enough um, when it was just the documentary. Um, and we kind of took it a little further and it sort of wraps the whole book and threads it like it, it ties a loose thread that wasn't resolved. Yeah. And, and I didn't even realize that that thread hadn't resolved itself until making those changes. And then it, like once that was completed it 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 was like it's the thing people fantasize about getting from an editor that like right. big aha moment where you, and it wasn't like she gave me the solution she just gave me the problem and i was like oh my gosh i didn't right. even know if you could that was the thing thoughts, then yeah right yeah so that helped a lot and then uh i revised it too to be less of a chris ware bite because there was there were a few moments in it where i 
when I was making Jacob's apartment, it was right after I had read um, Jimmy Corrigan and then just went like deep dive into Chris Ware because I was like, this guy's a genius. But yeah. one of the things I love that he would do when he transitioned panels is go like, and so, and thus. Yeah. And I actually borrowed that, like the and so, and thus. So that was the, in the original version of Jacob's apartment. And luckily this thread and the way of solving that helped me to revise the book. So it didn't have those. Cause they didn't really fit with like yeah. that works. If you're writing about like the world fair, you know, like that works right. perfectly, but right. You know, in the context of Jacob's apartment, it kind of pulls you out of the. Um, it's a little odd. Plot. Yeah, so, it would, yeah, right. So yeah, so it's weird because all the hesitance, like all the reasons I was hesitating, I don't think I understood until I had an editor kind of pull it apart um, and like point out those things, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's all it took was just those like those little things. So now I feel like really good about it, but. Um, but I do think that might have been why I was hesitating. But I know yeah, I know Corey and Jim were both like, dude, you'd be right. an idiot not to like pitch this thing out. Because right. I was in a scenario where we had all these leads with other publishers from two stories who were just like, yeah, we don't want this, but do you have something else? Yeah. And it's right. like, I literally had something else in my back pocket. So that's when that and then Not Death But Love went out as like a pitch. Um, and it was just this perfect two weeks. But this... So that's the long winded way of saying the surreal part was when it actually happened. It was like this rough idea because another reason I thought it would be cool is it just from an outer perspective is going to look kind of insane. It's like this guy just put out a graphic novel and then like a couple years later is putting right. out another like what the hell like. Right. Um, and that's all kind of a map that I came up with as kind of almost like a meme with our friends. I was like, that would look really cool. And yeah. then it, it was like a week later, it actually happened. And that's when Jim and I were talking about how strange it is that you just, yeah, you just make really good work and then opportunities just kind of happen. It's, it's very right. strange. Sorry, well, Gary. <laughs> what, what is that cliche about uh, an overnight success years in the making or whatever the, like something like that. I mean, yeah. that, like, so you just said I'm. You just have said a couple times in the past fifteen minutes or so. Just want to make a good story. Make a good story. I just want to put a good story out there. I'm not going to torture you and ask you what's a good story, but I'm gonna. I'm gonna say, when you think of all the stories you respond to, whether they con they're comics or movies or books or whatever, or even albums, if you can think of that as sort of a story. Do you, what, what you're drawn to, what you're attracted to, what you respond to, do you see any common threads through that? Do you see anything that like what you like to see in a story, what you think makes for a good story? Is there, I know that's a hard question, but like, rather than just in general, what makes a good story? What yeah. are the stories that you respond to? So, I mean, uh, among uh, like among my friends, you know, it's like I really like dinosaurs versus Mars bots. I do. And I think it's a good story. Now, why would like I why would I like the guy who's doing like auto bio and like uh, slice of life stuff be like so into a comic book called dinosaurs versus Mars bots? Aside yes. from the fact that dinosaurs and Martians are awesome and you're crazy. Cool. For saying yeah. that. That's not the case. <laughs> but the writing like. So to me, I think that there's actually a lot of commonality between what Gary does and what I do. Um, and I think that it's going to be corny to say, but it's like, I really think it's authenticity. I think authenticity for me is what I resonate with, with art. Now I've heard authentically terrible art before, for sure. Like authentically terrible yes. music, but here's the weird thing. A lot of stuff I like is also authentically terrible stuff. My right. favorite B movies are authentic. Like, yeah. and that's why I love them. Like I, 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 like Ed Wood is terrible, but authentically terrible. You can tell right. he really meant it when he was like flying glued paper plates uh, off of fishing hooks, you know, through the air. Like there's a, um, it, it's a hard to pin down thing, but I think that authenticity is, is uh, my, my number one barometer for um 
for art that I like. I, I've tr I've thought about this for like a long time. Like, what is the connection? Because I like right. art of all kinds of genres, um, and I think authenticity. And then I'd also say story structure. Um, I I like structured stories. I like structured stories that are deceptively like um, don't seem structured. You know. But but I but then I was thinking about it. It's like there's um there's a few movies. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna I'm gonna blank out on this movie. Magnolia, yes, would be an example of a story that just falls apart at the end. It just yeah. I mean it it the art the it it is it hits these peaks of brilliance that are ra rarely ever going to be in a movie, um and and so in depth with like character work, yeah, and character work that's like some of the best ever done. Yeah. Um, but they, they, they went so deep that the ending is like this epic, like failure, but it's like <laughs> a beautiful failure. I don't know if that makes sense. I, 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 it's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would rat like, that's another component. I really like when artists go hard, like when they, when they, when they lean into what yes. they're doing and if, even if they're going to fail, they fail so epically. <laughs> that is yeah. amazing there's like a, i like I, I also respond to sort of when i feel like i there's a fearlessness to yeah. what i'm reading or or watching or whatever yeah where whether it's good whether it succeeds or not like obviously ideally you want fearless art that's saying something authentic yeah. And like nails it, like that's the, that's. A, but even if you have fearless art that's saying something authentic that doesn't quite work, that still can be very interesting. Yeah, it's much know? more interesting than safe and yes. and and uh, corporate. Right. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Totally. I don't Obviously, know. Yeah. Um, does the, like it, it? It's hard. Other than that, to say the thing that resonates with me, because aside from that, I like most story arcs um like just tr structured arcs like i i don't tend to have a preference when it comes to those things that's why i like pin it to those other things because it's like i don't really care if it's in space or if it's like on uh, you know like a guy walking down the street to get a pack of cigarettes at the store you know like i think you know if, if you're doing a story about like a spaceship lost in space or, or a guy getting cigarettes it's the same it, it's the same need that needs to be there for it to be good, in my opinion. Oh, and then beauty, which I think is real. And then also um, saying something about debt would be a help. <laughs> saying thing. something about making making mistakes big. Um, so we're in the home stretch here. Sweet. <laughs> but now we're gonna we're gonna zoom out. We're gonna zoom away from from the micro of Jacob's apartment in two stories and back to more just uh, crumble as a person. Um, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> let's crumble it up. Yeah, let's crumble it up. Uh, so now the, this, I imagine one half of this question, maybe the answer will come easily to you right now because you're in the thick of it. When you're in creator mode, when you're thoroughly in production mode, uh, when are you feeling your lowest and most frustrated? Hmm. Like w when I'm in production mode. Um, yeah, when you're doing, when you're in the process of making, what is the most difficult time? When, when are the most difficult times? Okay, the, the most difficult time in production mode is, is your own limitations. So when you, as a human being, try to do an endeavor that's ambitious, um, you're always going to fail. Like uh, you, nine times out of 10, you're going to fail. Um, if you go out and you try to run a marathon or whatever, you're, you're rarely going to like be the first guy at the end of the line when you're taking right. on something new. Um, even if you're repeating something that you've taken on before, you know, it's a lot of work and you risk a lot. Um, and I would say that that's probably emotionally one of the toughest things about creating is just your own limitations. Like I get very frustrated that I can't just like today guarantee that I'm going to do like, 10 pages of comics and, right. and it, and it gets even harder. Like I don't do the compare and despair thing anymore um, because it, it's just a recipe for disaster, but it's like, I do know cartoonists like, like the, the, like Dave Baker, who everybody here should be following the work of. He's incredible. Right. But I mean, he's literally putting out another graphic novel uh, that he 
drew and illustrated and wrote and he's put out like a bunch that he's written in the last year and i know the guy works his butt off so it's not like some magic trick that he has it's like he works really hard right but it is it, i think that's the hardest thing is like realizing your own limitations and then accepting them but also butting up against them all the time yeah and yeah. that that ties really nicely with the other big uh problem when i'm in production mode i think the biggest hurdle is you you kind of have to ride the line between at least for i shouldn't say you i always make that mistake when i'm talking and it sounds like i'm saying like you out there and it's like no 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 uh, for me i can't get graphic novels finished if i'm playing it safe and not risking burnout i just can't like mm -hmm. i've tried for years to find some magic trick where that's not the case and i have to realize that at least for me, I've had to come to the realization and actually from studying and reading about other cartoonists and stuff, I've just come to accept that the process of cartooning is maddening and it will it will drive you a little a little close to burnout. Well, so, it's a little like a bicycle riding a bicycle where I think there's a um, a minimum momentum to yeah. stay up. You know, like exactly you can't, like you there. And it's yeah, you're not going to be able to like a little kid like that's when kids are falling over when they're trying to really like you kind of have to like hurl yourself down the road on it or the bike's going to fall over. And I exactly. feel like a little like that, you know. Yeah. And, and Gary, I think you and I are really similar in our work patterns in the sense that um, I, I've noticed this with the way you schedule your work, too, where it's like I for me, I need to have um, an expectation on myself of like a yeah. daily output. Um, and, but, but again, like, so because for me, I'm most productive when I'm kind of on that edge of burnout, that's the hard part is like balancing that so that I don't cross that line. And I will say it does get easier, uh, on your third graphic novel. So if you get through, you know, so if you write everybody, all the kids out there, if you get through about 150 pages of yeah. finished comic pages, mm -hmm. like it gets way easier. Yeah, just do your 230, right. you know, 250 pages. No problem. It gets You're even easier there. after that. I'm imagining yeah. by a thousand pages, right. it'll be like all you need to do is about 50 mini comics, and and you'll it, it it'll start to like you'll start to get a little more comfortable with it. There. But Gary, it's like. It is funny. It, it's weird, but it's like, so Jacob's apartment, that whole process was just like identity challenging. Um, that was my first graphic novel. So it's like every other page, you know, especially when I got to like the halfway point where I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm looking back and I've spent like a, like two years on this thing. And this is like my first graphic novel. So I'm like, I've spent two years on an art thing. Yeah. Like, is this worth it? Like, does anyone care? Like all of that stuff, is it even good? Like right. all of that stuff would just plague me throughout the process. Like just right. all sorts of just insecurity and insanity. Um, the second book, two stories, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I also knew how to plan better. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I knew like I need to be tighter with my scripts. And uh, I had a, I developed a process that's like very similar to what you've got now gary where it's like it's you know script thumbnail rough like then final and just treat yeah. it like like i'm my own film production you know yeah. um and then that was just mainly a struggle of like being faithful to the process and showing up but yeah. i wasn't plagued with questions throughout it like whether it was worthwhile or not like i knew it was i was making good work and i was like kind of to the point where i'm like no one reads indie comics so I'm just going to make this thing. Right. Third book. Um, right now, it's like it's just it's just the challenge of time. That's it. It's just time. Yeah. Like everything else is kind of worked out. I don't have a ton of insecurities about it. It's just like dealing with my own limitations. That always frustrates me because I want to be better um, and time. Right. I don't know, okay. Gary. What about you <laughs> for your 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 process? You know, Um. Well, I definitely can respond. I, I definitely uh, identify with your your um, observation that you kind of need to be riding the line a little bit. 
But yeah. For it to be working for you to be productive and getting stuff done and actually finishing, you probably have to be going a little harder than you're comfortable. Yeah. Uh, that if I was working at a comfortable leisurely rate, it would never get done. Uh, oh, but that, rem that reminds me of one that I'm curious if you have. Yes. Um, the, the thing that never changes about doing art projects that you care about, uh, everyone comes out of the woodwork to distract you from <laughs> yeah. making the work and yeah. it, and that never goes away you can design your life to have people around you who are supportive of your art yeah. and even those people the most supportive people yeah will instantly like want to become a roadblock to your book like they don't know they're doing they it. don't know it no that's 100 percent. i i do think it's gotten better for me but i think partly because um now, you know, I, I don't remember when 75, I started drawing 75. It's been, but it's been a few years now. And yeah. this has been a fairly regular, you know, I finish one, I take a few months off, I start writing the next one, and then I start drawing. So it's been like for the past few years, I've been in some either writing or drawing a D versus M. Um, so I think people are now kind of used to me being semi available most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think also, uh, I think COVID helped and I, I, in a, in a bad way, you know, like I think COVID, I, I don't know if you're having the same experience, but I feel like social life in general has been kind of just dialed way down ever since COVID because of COVID. Like, I think we're all still behaving a little bit yeah. under lockdown protocols, even though it's not lockdown anymore. And that, yeah made it but no i used to tell people all the time it's actually i it's funny i i i because i'll read anything i like reading years and years and years ago i read like arnold schwarzenegger put out this bible on like bodybuilding this giant book on like his approach to it his thoughts on it and it's something that my dad or my brother had bought and when i was living you know at home and i just sat and read it because it was like something to read and it was actually fascinating. Schwarzenegger is a fascinating guy. If you haven't watched Pumping Iron, that documentary, you have to watch Pumping Iron. I've made. So I agree many, with that. Yeah, I've made yeah. so many people watch it, and they're like, "I don't care about any of this." It's like neither do I. Neither yeah. do I. You're gonna love it. Yeah. Like, and especially for fellow creatives, because I find there's a lot in common between artists and like bodybuilders or any kind of obsessive athlete. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of the Venn diagram kind of overlaps in a lot of interesting ways, but something he talked about right off the bat, he's like, if you decide you're going to do this, if you decide you're going to take bodybuilding seriously, you're going to, this is what's going to happen. You're going to tell all your friends, you're going to tell all your friends, this is my new thing. They're going to be like, that's awesome. That's great. You're going to tell them like, I'm going to be in the gym this many hours a day. I'm going to be having to like eat this this way. I'm going to have to like cut this out. I'm going to have to be going to bed at this time. I'm going to have to be getting up. Like all these things, you know, and they'll be like, that's all. I can't believe you're doing it. That's awesome. Good for you. Good for you. And he's like, the next day, they'll call you up. Hey, we're going to the bar. Do you want to come and have some beers? And it's like, I don't, I can't. That's not, but that it's exactly the same if you're going to take on some ambitious creative project. If yeah. You, let's, say, let's say you want to write a novel. And every night you, you've decided, like, I got to turn out at least a page a day, you know, or whatever your thing is. And every night you're going to, after work, you're going to go home and write. You're going to tell everybody that. They're going to say, it's great. Can't wait to read it. I'm so excited for you. You deserve to be published. And then a week later, they're like, we're going to the Caribbean for a week. Are you in? And like now, or we're going to Vegas. You know? And it's like, no, I'm writing. Like, I'm, I, I told you. They don't realize they're sort of being the devil with the temptation coming in like, hey, hey, yeah. I know you have this plan, but it's universal, I think. Yeah. And I think that um, a good thing for creatives to know, because when you're younger, I think at least when I was younger, when I did Jacobs, that's a good example, like first graphic novel. I, I very much put that on my friends, like weirdly enough. I mean, not so much, but I'd like almost explain to them how they're distracting me from my thing and I need to focus on this thing. I felt yeah. like maybe I needed to train the people around me or whatever. Yeah. At, now I realize that, no, it's, 
like I've gotten much healthier with it where it's like, no, you just need to draw clear boundaries as a creative and you don't need to chide people for it because no. at the end of the day, it's not their job for you to make a graphic novel. And, and it's not on, it's not on anyone else for you to be creative. And I think that's one of the things that um, it, it is, is, is something that I've, I've definitely learned throughout the process of this is like these books will not make themselves the time to make them will not make itself and it's not where you work's job to help you make a graphic novel it's like it's no one else's job right to make that happen but your own so it's like it, it's kind of like it is like bodybuilding or doing anything positive it's like yeah or dieting right like no right. one else around you has the responsibility for you to diet if you want to diet for your health, it's going to require self-discipline. It's going to require saying no to things. It's going to require like all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and making books is exactly the same scenario where it's just like it's self-discipline. And honestly, it, it's hard. And I'm not always the most self-disciplined, you know. No. Well, and, it's, yeah. and if it's something you're not doing, like most normal people, yeah, <laughs> most normal, healthy, happy people well-balanced people are not who don't think about death themselves. all the time <laughs> they they can't possibly understand so you have you can't you can't be no yeah. and you're right you can't be like sort of snitty like like have a snit about it yeah <laughs> you know because someone's like hey we're you know we're going away for the weekend are you and you can't be like you know i'm doing a thing like i mean that's ridiculous like, and to be honest i i'm just owning the fact that uh, when i was a young artist you know i was totally that guy who well, was doing that. I yeah. was too. you you but you do start to realize like they don't they've got yeah. their own life and they, they don't they've never done this and they don't yeah. understand and you can tell them about it but hearing something and understanding something are completely different things, which yeah. is something you also learn with maturity. So you just, you finally just get used to saying like, I'm so, I'm, I can't, unfortunately, I'm sorry. I'm busy, you know, every time, you know, and that's the, that's the discipline. And yeah. the point that Schwarzenegger was making in his book is like, that's, what's going to separate the people who do this and don't like the people who, when your friends come around and say like, Hey, we're going to enter a hot dog eating contest. <laughs> when you finally announced like, I'm going to, you know, be a bodybuilder. Like the ones that are going to do it are the ones that have discipline, discipline to say, and the motivation to say, no, that sounds fun, but I can't. Or there'll be people who are like, well, okay, I'll do this and then I'll do it. You know? And that's like, you're, you're screwed. You're never going to do it. Give up. Give up now, save yourself some trouble, you know? And so, yeah, for sure. Then, so now we've done the difficulty, the, the dark times of creating. When are you feeling best? When are you feeling your most, your, the, at the height of your creative powers? Like when you feel like it's, it's now like, I can do this. I am talented. I am special. I am pretty. I am like all the things, you know, like, there's a few of those, um, and I think that, that we might share these too, but there's this fleeting moment <laughs> fleeting. when you're finished. It's yeah. very fleeting. It's fleeting. When you're finished yeah. with a book and it's actually printed. Yes. And you see that first print. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not kidding about it being fleeting. It can be like a minute to yeah. like an hour yes. of feeling that book. Definitely no more than a half a day. No, like that's max. Yeah. Like if you're lucky, you'll get the hit that long. Yeah. It, it's well, like it is... about DMT trips, how it lasts like eight minutes. Yeah. You're, you're traveling through the galaxy. You're meeting the machine elves. It's amazing. And then boom, you're in your bed again. Like that's kind of what it's like to hold that physical proof. Totally. Yeah. 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 And, and like that is a moment that is so fun. Yeah, that you are forever chasing that as a as a fan of printed work, and I'm with Gary on that. That's the only books are printed books. I'm just with right. Gary on that. I'm saying, right. like, ebooks are not valid. I'm just kidding, yeah. kind of, but <laughs> I'm kind of with Gary on that. We're kind so, of kidding. Yeah, kind we're semi kidding. kidding, but we're total book snobs. But as a we person are. who like yeah. loves books, and that's my intention when I'm making it, um, it there is just this surreal cool thing about that um the there's these moments and i think we all have this i think as a cartoonist you kind of have to have like amnesia a little bit like it's almost like um when women give birth 
yeah. to a kid and then they somehow some are able to like do that again and like they just and you ask them about the first birth and i i've i've even had this with my wife where i'll ask her about details and she doesn't remember like half of half of the horror <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is childbirth yeah it's just like a weird thing. It's like it just something happened in her brain that just kind of whitewashed a lot of those really just terrifyingly violent moments, you know? <laughs> the ripping and the tearing and the I mean it's agony. just it is yeah, it is brutal. But I th right. think that and I'm not saying it's the same as childbirth at all, but I'm saying I think there's a thing that artists must have with the process of things. Because every time I finish a page, like with not death, but love, every time I finish a page and then I, I look at it, I'm like, that's awesome. Like, I'm really excited about how that came out. And then I will proceed to hate the whole process and then finish the page and be like, you know, that's not bad. I think I got to do another one. Um, you know, you know, and I've, I've started to enjoy the process more. Um, yeah. But it really is to me, I, I think I'm very results oriented where I, I, it, the biggest joy for me comes out of the fun, the finished thing, it, whether it's the finished page, the finished book. Um, I just, I don't get a lot of joy about unfinished things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I mean, you actually nailed probably what would have been my two answers. Like for sure, nothing beats the first copy in your yeah. hand. Like nothing even comes close to that. The next for me would absolutely be, especially if it's a page that's been fighting you, like a page where it's like, this just isn't looking right. I'm yeah. not happy with this. This is a slog. It, or it's taking like a million times longer than you intended. You You're wanted, like, right. it? Yeah. Yeah. And when it, but when it finally turns that corner, there is a small peak moment in there. Like, um, and more so than a page that was, went swimmingly. Yeah, that you were happy the whole way through. There's something about those ones that you have to drag across the finish line. When it is finally done and you end up liking it, you, that gives you a moment. Like, yeah. a, it's brief. It's even briefer than holding the proof. It's like a minute, a couple yeah. minutes, you know. But yeah, but then like, but those you you, you definitely feel it there. Yeah, sure. comics are a very abusive. Uh, it, it's like comics are an abusive boyfriend. <laughs> like they're like they're like uh, you know showing up with candies that you right. eat, and maybe they take like two seconds to eat, and you're like, "Wow, they love me," and then yeah. they just pummel you for after the big for, fight, like, after the hours. huge fight. It's like Turner showing up with the roses, baby. I'm sorry. Baby, yeah, I, every time it's like, gonna it'll be, be better like next time. Again, baby. You gotta baby. tackle another page. Trust, yeah, trust. Just stay in there. Stay you dedicated. Do it more time. Just come on, just a little bit longer. We're going to my parents' house next weekend. You got it. Come on. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> uh, that's so good. Okay. Uh, just We're in the home stretch now. I think I've got three last general questions for you. Um, so, what would have to be true? for you to define yourself as a successful creator or would you already? Hmm. I don't think you can define success. I think that you can find, well, I mean you personally, like, yeah. When would you be able to sit quietly to yourself and say, I'm a successful creator? What would I, that be the true case? I can't tell. Cause like I've, I, this is the hard part. I, there are things that I set out to do as an artist when I was younger, you know, and I've achieved a lot of those things. Um, and each thing I've achieved, there's usually a new achievement that I'm somehow, you know, seeking after. So it's like, in a weird way, it's like I've succeeded in, in some scenarios where I think some artists might look at me and be like, Oh, this guy's a success. Um, like the barometer of like when I was a young student and I just wanted to make a living doing art, that's something I succeeded at long ago and I've managed to keep going. Um, you know, there's some awards and stuff that I've gotten or design annuals like that felt like a success, but then it's like, it, it's, it's hard to like TCAF was a thing that I wanted to do for a long time. Um, uh, having a graphic novel that's available in bookstores and that's just ticked off the list. Um, 
I, but it's like, it's hard to say. I mean, I think for myself, what I, I have self expectations. One is that like, I need to provide for my family. Um, that's a huge one. So like for me, if I'm doing that, I'm succeeding. That's good. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I do feel like I'm always going to be chasing something because I remember when I first started making comics, I just wanted like one reader, like just one person to like read the book and be into it. And then I did get that. And then I'm like, I just want 10 people. Like, And yeah. it's, it's like, it's a, um, I, I kind of think we're designed as, as humans to like constantly be seeking after something. It's like the, um, the, uh, nature hating a vacuum. We have a vacuum and we're just filling it with things. Yeah. Um, and I recognize that in myself for sure. Um, but I, but I, I don't know what I would consider a success for myself. I, I literally can't answer that. I can answer that for other artists, but like what I would consider a success in others. Yeah. But um, yeah, I kind of even think the idea of success might even be a myth right. um, in general. I don't know. Do you have a good answer for that? That's a tough one. I don't know if I have a good answer. Yeah. I, I, I think... Uh... I think I'm considering my answer before I say it out loud and make it real. Um, I think I don't know if there's a there, look. There's there are certain things that would, I, of course, I would be thrilled about, like sell, you know. X number of sales, yeah, getting picked up by somebody or wh whatever the thing, you know, you can, we can all make up the things, the, the, a certain award or, or being on a panel somewhere yeah. at Comic Con or, you know, like you can all think of things. It's like, that would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. But I also, I, I believe I could be wrong, but I believe that they probably would be very much like the holding of the physical proof. Yeah, it would be elation for that moment, and yeah. then it would quickly evaporate. You know, like that, and it would it would it'd be like that video we all seen of the raccoon washing cotton candy in the stream. Like exactly. somebody the raccoon cotton candy, and it goes to wash it, and it all disappears, and it's like just looking around. Like I think it would be a little like that. I, I do, do too. Yeah, I like like you know imagine like. You know, if I put myself in the shoes of like, so I, I would kill for an Eisner. Well, I wouldn't actually kill for it, but it would be cool to have an Eisner. It's something that I read. Somebody up badly. Yeah, you I'd take leave. somebody out for, but um, <laughs> you would you take know, theirs. You'd break into their house, tie them up. I'm coming for you, Dave Baker. Yeah, if you get that thing. Um, he's nominated. Wouldn't right kill now, him. Wouldn't so. kill him. Um, but uh, but anyhow, um, uh. I, I, it would be fun, but if I think about it and if that were to actually happen in some hypothetical world, I know like the second, you know, that happened, I'd be like, well, what about two? Right. <laughs> you know, like it's just, right. I don't know if there's ever. Because I think that's not really. And when I, when I do yeah. that role play in my head, yeah, it makes me think, therefore, that's not really the thing that will sad that's not the thing you're after that's not the thing that really means anything to you 100%. i do believe i hope i can hold on to this cuz i think it's an important and i think it's a it's a good clean belief for an artist is that circling back to something we were talking about earlier if you're daily or near daily engaged in the create of authentic art where you're being honest and you're going hard on the paint and you're trying to make a thing and you're putting it out there, you're successful. Now, some people are going to think that's very like. I kind of agree. But I, I actually do believe, I think that's the only metric. Like, really. I agree. I think the other metrics aren't, aren't like the things you can be responsible in life are the things you have control over. Right. Um, you have control over whether you make art. Uh, some people don't, right? Like some people maybe like, I don't know if my arms got cut off or something. It's like, well, maybe I don't have control. Maybe, you know, um, but like in general, you have control over those things. And I think those are the things that have to be the barometer of success because a lot of the other things require so many external factors. Right. Um, 
that you have no control over. Really. Yeah, you can exactly you can weigh the odds in your favor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Rick Rubin quote about it was I. It's something I brought. I go back to a lot because I think about it. He was talking to somebody, and he's like, "What's the advice for songwriting?" And he's like, "You just have to actually like be willing to like sit down and try every day, whether whether anything happens or not." And he's like, and he, his analogy was like, it's like fishing. I can't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to catch three fish today. You have no control over that. What you do have control over is getting out on the boat and sitting on the lake and having your line in the water and waiting. Mm -hmm. Like you can be present, you can be available for fish, <laughs> but you can't make the fish happen. And yeah. it's the same with, I think, creative stuff. Like you, you can't make yourself a success. You can't make yourself get published. You can't make yourself make a million dollars. But you can be doing everything else that's in your domain, which is yeah. going up and, and trying hard and trying honestly. Yeah. And I think that, um, I mean, you know, like for me, I also think there are things like I, I, I think this is where like the death thing kind of comes into play, too. There are things beyond just like material right. um, that I think are worth thinking about that can also help with that kind of illusion of success idea. Um, you know, where it's like, for me, like I, I'm a Christian. I know a lot of people aren't um, and that's okay. I'm not trying to preach or anything, but it's like for myself, it's like, that is the ultimate success is like, is, is like, I will, I, I have kind of a purpose that I believe in that's kind of beyond like anything that I can do with my own power. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually really helpful. And I, I would encourage people to have something like that. Um, yeah. that's, you know, whether it's, uh, it, it also will help with like stress and anxiety and stuff like that. Like, you, you know, prayer and all that kind of, um, thing. But it's like, to me, like also just having some idea of like what you feel purpose is, um, it, even if the purpose is purposelessness, I just think like thinking about it is a good, good thing to do. Cause even like, it, you know, even a, a solid existentialist is going to have a solid uh, answer about identity sure. um, and like and and success and stuff like that. Um, one other thing on success, if you're making a living as an artist, you're not just succeeding, you're cheating. And I think that's amazing. You've just cheated a system that yeah. wants consumption. Yeah. And I think that if you can do that, um, good job. Yes. Yeah. Good for you. I also, a quick deviation, I want to agree with Corey. Hellboy 2 is a phenomenal movie. Like, oh, yeah. It's just, it really, and I don't, you know, I like the comics. The first movie was all right. Hellboy 2 is amazing. Mm -hmm. so just, yeah, definitely. I agree with you. Uh, Guillermo del Toro, right? So good. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, I want his house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. I just want to visit. I just like, I would love just to walk through his crazy library. But um, so last question that I had planned, um, you're, you live your life pretty, a good chunk of it on YouTube. <laughs> you're, you're pretty, you're pretty out there. People see your wife, they see your son, they see your house, they see your process, all those different things. You're very open. Your work is very honest. Uh, that said, at least in my feeling we're all in some level unknowable we're all a little hard to kind of grasp and we all draw pictures of other people in our mind and have relationships with those pictures and they might not have anything to do with the real person at least among the art casters community what do you think is a misperception about you or a misconception what is something that you think people probably don't realize about you oh that's a good question i that's actually i don't even know if i can answer that because i am one of the easiest people to know. Um, and this is for like people online and offline. Like, I think one of the things that people tend to value about me is I, I, I'm just a really, I'm a shitty liar. Um, I'm not saying I don't lie. Um, sure. I have definitely lied in the past. And if anybody ever says I never lie, like you've met a really, really prominent liar. Um, yeah. right at that yeah. instant. Yeah. Um, that's but actually, just, I think in personality tests. Yeah uh they'll put questions like that in 
to tell if the person is answering the questions honestly. Yeah. Questions are like, do you ever lie? Have you ever been angry enough that you wanted to hit someone? Things yeah. like that where everyone should say yes. Yeah. So if they say no, you know they're not being honest on the Yeah, time. you're like, okay, this is this is a, a real like non-truth teller. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, but I but I am really bad at lying. I like I'm I'm just really bad at it. I've never been good at it. And I'm bad at thinking internally. Like I, I've had that problem my whole life, like part of why I talk so often, because I'm a talker. And uh, part of why I talk so much is like, that's how I think, like, I think out loud a lot of the time. Um, and so you kind of get what you see with me, I, I'm trying to think if there's like a perception that the hard part about that, too, is like, I wouldn't really know the external perception of me, right? I'm stuck in me. So I right. wouldn't know. Um, right. I would say that you know, I think that like people who are familiar with my work and didn't like watch YouTube might have a perception that I'm like this guy who's like sitting alone emoting in a room. Very, you know, very dour. Yeah. Very, right. Yeah. Whereas I think people on my YouTube community know I'm like a goofy, just like silly person. Like I'm a pretty right. goofy person. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's a misperception um yeah i don't know i i would I, that's a really good question and i i now it makes me want to see if there's a misperception in the community i know, I know that right. there's a misperception sometimes in a comics community that i think is is unfair where it's like i don't think anybody should put an expectation on any other creator like i shouldn't tell gary he shouldn't have political thoughts or he shouldn't have um, different philosophies. Um, I think that like human beings should be allowed to human being. Yeah. So that that would be well. And there is thing. something sometimes you know when I see that. Sometimes I think you can see it for what it is, which is like I don't like the thing you just said. There, exactly, I think you should be expressing it, yeah. which is like that's usually I think the root of it, which is yeah. very easy to dismiss. Exactly. I think sometimes, and it maybe that even the first one can be colored by this. It's what I would categorize as like toxic capitalism, where the I like when they, especially when the argument is you're alienating some of your potential audience by saying it's like, oh, are you my manager now? Yeah. Do you get do you get a nickel every time I sell a comic? Shut the fuck up. Like you know, like this has it's such a and it's a weird preoccupation. But some people I think will say that earnestly. Like they're yeah. concerned, like you're not going to sell as many comics as you could because some people are going to be turned off by what you're saying. That you are worried about that kind of shows, it kind of goes back to being a successful artist. It yeah. shows how differently you think about what I do than what I think and what I think I'm doing. What yeah. I think I'm doing is being authentic and honest and putting work out there, which in a lot of ways would be incompatible with me being closely guarded about, you know, like, oh, I better not say anything about this. I exactly. Not say I don't like Trump because a super Trump fan might not buy my book. That to me is super dishonest. Yeah. You know? it's, like, I, it's a strange expectation to, and, and especially to put on, um, because I have actually gotten that feedback. So I guess this would tie into the question. Um, uh, cause there was a, a few people who reached out to me and were just like, Oh, I wish you would be less, uh, open about your politics and stuff. And I was like, have you guys read my work? Right. Like I literally talk about being suicidal, like about like being bullied as a kid in school. Like I'm burying my soul in art. That's yeah. what I think the artist should do regardless yeah. of what you're doing. Yeah. You should be burying your soul. Like that is art. Right. And it's like, if you're not burying your soul, like what are we supposed to be like some boring, like Avon salesperson about art? Like that's yeah, it feels we're not selling makeup. Like we're selling art. Okay. Like yeah. that's, well, yeah. I would be not literally, but somewhat worried about like a, a strange psychic crack up. If I had to like, well, I need to be this way now because I'm a merchant. I'm not yeah. an artist. I'm a merchant. You know, and like that's I, I remember I'm not going to name names, but there was someone. It was an art. I think it came up. Name in a, all the names, every single all one. of them, everyone. You know We're what? Make a checklist at the end number. of this. Here's their address. No, I yeah, but it was a, there was an art caster's guest. This was a long time ago, but 
but the topic came up like i think this topic came up like are, are there things like should you be political should you talk about whatever the thing is whatever the controversial thing that might alienate part of your audience and there was i think a guest on who kind of and I'm not, I'm not saying this person is wrong. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying this person is full of it and I'm right. That's not yeah. what I'm saying. But I just 100% disagree. Where they were finding ways, it's like, no, I can see, like, maybe you wouldn't want to, maybe I wouldn't. They're not entitled to know. And, like, to me, like, let's say I'm at a con. And some guy comes up and it's like, I'm really interested in your book. But I don't give money to people who have this position on abortion. What is your position on abortion? <laughs> like they want to know. Do I think that's weird? Yes. Do I think that's kind of like I would never do that? 100% I would never yeah. do that. Do I think it's fair? You know, I think we all, especially with like, you know, we all have the ability to choose where our money goes. Yeah. You know, I think, I, and I, I think it would be dishonest of me to withhold information. If that's that important, Yeah. this person, to me now I'm being deceptive. That's their moral dilemma. That Their moral dilemma is to figure out if they want to buy my book, even if they disagree with me on this element. Yeah. You know, like that's not for me to like, well, I'm not going to tell them. I'm going to play the shell game. I'm going to try it, you know, because like I, because I really need that $10. That's yeah. gross. Like that's a gross feeling. And I just, I'm not going to play that. I'm yeah, gonna... I totally agree. I, I don't, you know, like I don't go out of my way to be like overtly political or overtly opinionated in public, but I am a human being with opinions and politics and, and right. different ideas as are people who are pretending they don't have politics. Like it's right. Um, so it's like, it's one of those things of like, I don't plan to filter myself any more than I have to. Like, you know what I mean? Like if I, if I were talking about my, my own workplace or something, then I'm going to have a filter. Um, yeah. but it's like, I don't, I, I just, uh, I, I don't see why you would want that from an artist. Um, no. and again, like, I don't really ask artists what their politics are when I'm going to buy their work. It's a weird um, thing. And if they're overtly political and I don't agree with their politics and I don't want to give them my money, cool. Yeah, that's your call, man. You Who spend cares? your money where you want. Yeah. You know? Like, but but I that I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to tell you because I don't know what the right answer. Is. Exactly. You know, exactly. like that's no, that's I mean, that's kind of kind of wussy. Like, you know, yeah. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. Own own your own your truth. Uh, let's see. This I thought was interesting. No one's ever told me that, but I also think my politics are over the board enough that no one has any idea where I stand generally. I would at least agree with that with Corey. Like I, I, he's a little enigmatic to me, though. I do know he's a huge fan of social media. Yeah, and he uh, he's a big fan of social media. Living our life, yeah, on these platforms mm -hmm. in every meaningful way and sharing all our personal information. Yeah. I, I think he actually voted for Facebook for president. Not I think not, he did. Yeah, I think not, just not Facebook. Just Zuckerberg. the whole company. I think he voted yeah. for face. He wrote in Facebook. Yeah. Facebook mm -hmm. for president. Right. Uh, the algorithm he wrote in. The algorithm oh, the algorithm. Involved. Yeah, that's true. Because he wanted the AI to run the country. I think that was a quote by Cory Kerr. I'm entitled to the sanctity of my mind. That is true. I I, I wonder if that's a reference to. You. I sent him a podcast the other day. It was an interview. I thought he'd find interesting um it's a woman who's she's very interested in the idea of protecting your right to basically mental privacy nice <laughs> that we're going to get to a point where it will be a there will be ways to invasively kind of get a sense of what people are thinking and feeling and now would be the time to start staking out that territory that you have some privacy to your own thoughts you have yeah. some privacy yeah but that means yeah and i i mean i can see um depending on the work that you're doing as an artist like how you kind of run your persona or whatever but it's like for me i don't have a need for a persona because like i'm an auto bio cartoonist like that's why it's always hilarious to me when people will put the standard that they're trying to pressure like people making like action comics on me and i'm like i look like I'm not even looking at the comics you guys were looking at. Like you, right. you know, I'm not looking at the industry you're mad at. Like I, right. I 
I literally like I'm the weird guy in the corner buying the hardcover fanographics book and being like, this is beautifully printed on French paper. That's yeah. my audience. Right. Same. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm the same. I, I do. I always feel a little I don't feel uncomfortable, but I can tell I'm out of my element when I'm especially if I go on like Foo's channel with Squatch and those guys. They're talking about some element of Marvel versus DC or something. And it's like, I, I don't, I, I'm not being dismissive. It's not yeah. like whatever, man. But it's like, it's just something that I just don't. Yeah, it's it's equivalent when, like, when I'm around people who are talking about sports and I'm just like, yeah. I okay, I don't sports, but it sounds interesting. I just yeah. don't even know. It sounds like, fun. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, exactly. right. I mean, it's, yeah. All right. Well, we're approaching the one hour 45 mark. I got through my Charlie Rose questions. Awesome. That was um, fun. What are you doing today? I'm assuming drawing all day. I'm going to be rocking some drawings all day. Yeah. yeah. On the on the chase lounge, really. The Actually, the character's not on a chase lounge anymore, but it was oh. hilarious. Because uh, Gary and I were both very obsessed with, are, are probably both still really into Wet Leg, the band. Yeah. And uh, I I tickets. Just, they're coming to Phoenix in September, and I have tickets. So. Ooh, that's awesome. Okay. I, I should. I think they'd be fun live. I think they uh, would be. 100%. Yeah. But anyhow, so we were talking about Chase Lounge like a week before I started doing roughs for the scripts, and I found out that. Elizabeth Bar Barrett Browning at the Barrett's residence had a chase lounge. And it was a very funny moment of yeah. for about 15 pages. You're drawing it. I was drawing Elizabeth Barrett Brown on a chase lounge, like all day long. <laughs> and it was just a thing. But now right. I have to say when she finally left that, that, that was the one thing I might've missed for the most, the biggest joy in the creative process. Really was drawing that. I'm not trying to derail you closing, but sure. What not drawing that the biggest joy for a sequential artist is actually when you have to be in a location for a long period of time and you're drawing the same backgrounds. Yeah. And then you are finally free of that background. Yes. There is an elation where, where when, when you actually get to a plot point where you have moved a character from point A to point B. Yeah. It's a really thrilling experience. It really like, is. It yeah. really is. And I can tell you, like, I've got a, only a few scene changes in 79. And I'm now basically, not really, but basically where the rest of this story is going to take place. Like, the, re the, 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 certainly the, all the climax, like, all the really, like, shocking, scary, big moments are now going to happen, like, where we are. Yeah. And, uh, when when you get there, but yeah, that's the other thing I think people probably don't understand about the creation process, and why would they? Is you're experiencing your story in like insane slow motion. Like when you're gonna read it, you're gonna read seventy nine in fifteen or twenty minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna be drawing it for more than a year, and so like you know, you're you're when which just exaggerates all these moments for you for yeah. when you're working on it, where it's like you get to the room and now you also know the story. Mm -hmm. So it's like when, I don't know, it's like now you're drawing the first time, like the X-Wings are approaching the Death Star. Exactly. <laughs> like, you know, like, okay, like we're here. Like, oh my gosh, I, everything's going to happen now. Like, this it is, is where it all comes together. And that's kind of like when you're drawing a book, it can be like that, where you, you get to that point and you're like, oh, it's fine. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm at like this very brief window of sunshine moment in, in the script I'm working on now. Um, and it's like after just a very like dark, like kind of just ominous sequence. And so I'm like, yeah, very much the slow motion relief where I'm like, I finally got them to Italy. Yeah. There's sunlight. It's very beautiful. Yeah. It's like they're finally, they finally arrived. Yeah. This character walked in. This is the yeah. first time we've seen this character who's going to be important later. You know, like that's, I mean, you're experiencing it like that. It's like if you watch exactly. a YouTube video on the quarter speed, like that's kind of where it's like, oh, oh, it's happening. And and I when you're creating it, a lot of the time it's kind of like that. And then you're trying to tell other people about the movie and they're like, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, watch I don't. that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. 
All right. Well, I probably need to get back to work. I know you need to get back to work. Same here. Yeah. Do you want to shout out any links, any pitches, any promo promos, any anything like that? Yeah. Uh, Jacob's Apartment, the book we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, I will just say, uh, please uh, order it through yeah. your local bookstore, um, through Barnes and Noble, um, through anywhere that sells books online. But the best thing you can do is go to your local bookstore and ask that they carry it. Uh, um, and I, I did a whole rant on this a little bit ago, but it's like, it's like when people are taking risks and trying to make good work, including Gary's work, like you guys should be supporting it because otherwise you get what you pay for. And so if you're tired of seeing the same old comics, start supporting comics that are outside of the same old comics. Yeah. Um, and two stories as well. So I that's, agree. that's it. I agree. As usual, I would just recommend like follow this channel, follow Josh's channel, start watching smart casters, all these people in this group. I think the one common thread is they're all doing things that are outside of the kind of mainstream. I mean, indie in, in and of itself is kind of outside the mainstream, but even within indie, there's kind of stuff that's yeah. trying to be mainstream and stuff that's definitely trying to do its own thing. And I think that's what we have all in common. Yeah. And I think that's probably why we've sort of coalesced into a weird clumpy scab of, mm -hmm. I don't know where I'm going with this metaphor, but you know, I mean, that kind of thing. So, so we're kind of like Sonic Youth, you know, that's a all. little bit, a little bit. Yeah. All right. Guys, I will see you next week. Uh, with any luck. No, I was going to say maybe I'll even be close to 25. I won't because I have the monster page next. So I'll probably be deep in the swamp of page 24, which nice. is a big page, an important page, crazy page, the page that I've only kind of half thought out because I wanted to sort of find it while I was drawing. Um, but by then I think I will have found it and now I'll be trying to make it awesome. So I'll, I'll probably be looking forward to the break from that page to uh, see everybody again. So that's awesome. And I'm going to laugh you finally. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. are, you are, right. you are, I, I'm still too slow for what I need to do, but I, I have finally passed because I'm on 25. Well, for what you need to do, I'm expecting at some point. You're yeah. I need to like, like, I need to really like double your output pretty soon. Right. Yeah. 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 So, all right. See you later, everybody.